All right, listen up. We don't have much time. Fortnite is an extraordinarily popular online video game with a colorful, cartoony aesthetic, a party-like vibe, countless corporate tie-ins, and a purposely addictive gameplay hook. 100 players are all dropped on a remote island, where they must fight to the death until there's only one left standing. But what if you don't feel like going all Lord of the Flies? Can you play Fortnite as a friendly pacifist? Now, that might seem like an absurd question to ask about an online shooter. But over the past few years, I've been conducting a series of social experiments by interacting with the game's systems and other players in unexpected ways. So come with me on a journey as I try to break Fortnite by acting like a Care Bear on a battlefield. To start, let's very briefly go over how the game works, for those who aren't familiar. At the beginning of each match, players are loaded into a flying school bus and skydive to the island below, where they rush to arm themselves with various multicolored guns that are modeled off of real-world firearms. Stand by for an important weather alert. Fortnite's game system then generates a deadly storm that encircles the island and closes in over time. If players get stuck in the storm, they quickly lose health and die. The storm mechanic is designed to deliver an escalating adrenaline rush, as players are forced into combat with each other in a rapidly dwindling safe zone. The last player remaining is awarded a victory royale. The accolade comes with a bunch of experience points, a unique umbrella item, and an intense shot of dopamine. The genre of deathmatch video games that are set in an ever-shrinking arena is referred to as a battle royale. That name is borrowed from the title of a dystopian Japanese movie about a group of troubled young students who are taken to a remote island and forced to battle each other to the death while a government system pushes them around the island. The stranded on a remote island premise is also strikingly similar to a classic 1954 novel that you were probably forced to read in school called Lord of the Flies. As you'll likely recall, that story also follows a group of young students who crash on a remote island and then quickly turn on each other in increasingly ruthless ways. The parallels to Fortnite's gameplay system should be obvious. But keep those two stories in mind because we'll be returning to both of them a little later. While Fortnite offers a plethora of other game modes, the standard solo Battle Royale deathmatch is by far the most popular, and the most profitable for Epic Games, bringing in an estimated $5 billion annually. Since the Battle Royale game mode is a winner-take-all system, that all but guarantees that anyone foolish enough to try to play as a pacifist will be shot on sight, even when just harmlessly skipping across the map. This is why the official pacifist achievement in Fortnite is widely regarded as the hardest accolade to earn. It's awarded for winning a victory royale without eliminating a single other player. As my first experiment, I'm determined to win that honor, no matter how many tries it takes. Several years back, Fiction author and vlog brother John Green did a series of YouTube videos where he tried to play Fortnite as a pacifist. Don't pause to look at the flowers even though they are really beautiful. Just run straight and just hope that... Despite many valiant attempts, he didn't ultimately win. His personal rule while playing was that he wouldn't shoot first, but would return fire if attacked. I had to do it, sir! I'm so sorry! Which I'm is a so funny sorry. definition of pacifism. Oh I'm so sorry. For my attempt, I'm going to make things even more difficult by playing as a true pacifist, meaning my own rule is that I won't take any action that might harm another player. In fact, I won't even pick up a weapon. I'll basically be an unarmed civilian, though the other players won't necessarily know that. Okay, first we want to land somewhere out of the way, some backwater corner of the map 
without a lot of quest locations or treasure chests. Next, we need to find as many extra health and shield items as we can carry. Fish are perfect for this. My strategy also involves collecting quick escape or disguise power-ups. Uh, I'm a mailbox. Invisibility is good. Rift items are great. Once we're stocked up, we need to find a place to hide and wait. Because although we won't be shooting at anyone, the other 99 players are unlikely to return the favor. We'll be doing a lot of hiding and waiting. And even more waiting and hiding. But when the storm approaches, we'll need to sprint to the next safe zone. I should quickly interject here that while in real life I advocate for de-escalation and non-violent conflict resolution, I'm not actually a pacifist. Inside of Fortnite, however, it's really interesting to cosplay as one. Let's just hide here for... Oh, that is not good. All right, what if we... No! The only way to win a battle royale as a pacifist is for the remaining players to either simultaneously kill each other, which is extremely rare but does happen, or for them to make a huge mistake, like getting stuck in the growing storm. There's only two players left, and I need to get out of the storm very quickly. We're gonna make it. Wait, that guy needs to get out of the way. No! Oof. And I killed him. Well, try again. After many, 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 many attempts, I finally did it. I won a victory royale in Fortnite without ever firing a shot. It turns out that the pacifist accolade is only worth 700 experience points. That's a laughably small number for what's supposed to be the hardest achievement in the game. So part of my experiment at least is possible. You can play Fortnite as a pacifist. Though it does feel a little anticlimactic, because my success is dependent on the misfortune of others. But it got me thinking. Maybe there's something even more difficult to achieve in Fortnite. Since the game builds itself as a social experience, is it possible to make friends inside of a Battle Royale deathmatch? Seems a little ridiculous, but we're gonna find out. First though, we need to talk about how the game's mechanics and incentive structures are designed to work against social play. Like most other shooters, the core power fantasy is built on the thrill of superiority that comes from dominating other players. But unlike military-themed battle royale games, Fortnite is marketed as a social, metaverse experience that doesn't take itself too seriously. Trailers and other promotional material feature vibrant art styles, dance music, and a relaxed, happy-go-lucky vibe. But this social, party-like atmosphere is at odds with the structure of the battle royale. Because that game mode offers no real reason to engage in any pro-social ways, while heavily incentivizing antisocial behavior. Gunning down other players in Fortnite grants a variety of rewards. For instance, when a player is eliminated in the game, they drop all the weapons and power-ups they've collected thus far. Those items can then be picked up and used by their killer. In general, the better a player does in combat, the more experience points, or XP, they'll earn for that match. Extra points are earned for shooting someone in the head. XP helps players level up, and via a Battle Pass subscription, they can gain permanent cosmetic styles and new character avatars called skins. Because of the way Fortnite's Battle Pass subscription works, unlocking the next reward always requires just a little bit more XP. This intentionally addictive reward structure incentivizes players to kill as many of their fellow players as possible. 
On a fundamental level, this is an antisocial zero-sum system, because it means that continuing your own fun requires ruining someone else's. Now, to be fair, there do exist a variety of non-shooting related activities, some of which grant XP. You might be asked to collect a specific item type on the map, though you're very likely to get murdered while doing it. As we've seen, you can also go fishing for power-ups. And guns, apparently. You can water ski behind a shark. And you can hatch and ride a dinosaur. But fun as they might be, all of these game mechanics are really designed to give players an edge in combat. In fact, at the end of the day, everything in the game is in the service of Fortnite's core kill or be killed gameplay loop. So if Fortnite is a party, it's a murder party. The game's antisocial modality is underscored and reinforced by a built-in mechanic wherein winners can celebrate or mock the death of losing players. That's really obnoxious. Even in the waiting area before a game begins, players will regularly attack each other, even though it has no measurable effect. So while Fortnite's battle royale may be many things, social definitely isn't one of them. On the very rare occasions when the developers turn off combat in the main Battle Royale mode, like they did during an in-game concert performed by a giant Ariana Grande, the core game mechanics still don't encourage or require collaborative social interaction between the players. All of this means that making friends is going to be harder than winning as a pacifist. Much harder. Because I'll be asking other players to join me in rebelling against the game's incentive structure. My friend-making strategy is multifaceted. First, I need to present myself as non-threatening. While my favorite monkey outfit is friendly looking, I also tried to buy the cutest avatars that I could find in the Fortnite store. I don't know what this is supposed to be, but it's cute, so we'll try it. How could this fluffy creature be anything other than friendly. Okay, so cuteness alone is clearly not enough. I should note that although voice chat does exist for team play, there's no option for proximity chat with opposing players during a match. Meaning I can't just tell people that I want to be friends. In order to communicate, players have to purchase non-verbal emotes. Emotes are like trying to talk to people using a language of interpretive dance moves. So I collected a whole bunch of emotes that might signal to other players that I wasn't a threat. Those that allow synchronized interactions might be especially useful. Next I tried offering gifts to opposing players, primarily by throwing various power-ups at them. It's not as effective as I'd hoped. At some point I learned that there does exist a sort of unwritten code for a temporary truce. If you hit the crouch button over and over again, it can signal to others that you don't intend to fight them, at least not at that moment. I should say, this is very different from the act of repeatedly crouching over a fallen opponent in Halo or Call of Duty which communicates something decidedly more disrespectful. Of course, not every player in Fortnite knows this is code for a non-aggression pact. Or, more likely, the incentives for getting an easy kill are just too irresistible. The crouching trick is also a good way to signal to other players that you're not a robot. At some point over the past few years, Fortnite introduced AI-driven bots that masquerade as human players. So there is always a chance that the player we're interacting with is actually an algorithm. Okay, this guy is clearly a robot. And you can't make friends with a robot. They simply don't know how. It's kind of sad, actually. Okay, next I'll just try riding my flying rainbow unicorn pinata right up to somebody. And that is how I managed to befriend John Wick 
in the middle of a deathmatch. Oh, is this for me? It's just what I've always wanted. So it turns out you can, in fact, make friends inside of a battle royale. Oh, no, you don't. That guy needs to leave my new best friend alone. <clears throat> anyway, after my initial success, I've continued making friends in Fortnite. My bestie and your bestie sit down by the fire. Your bestie says you want party, so can we make these flames go higher? Talking about head now. The trick is to use a combination of unexpected tactics to effectively interrupt the standard gameplay loop. This type of intervention creates a window during which it's possible to sometimes forge a friendship. Even if it's only a temporary one. Now, I'm highlighting Fortnite in this video, but I could be saying basically the same things about any number of similar games. I don't know if it's possible to make friends with your opponents in, say, Call of Duty Warzone. Maybe, or maybe not. Honestly, I didn't have the stomach to find out. It's one thing to make friends near the beginning of a match, when the stakes are relatively low. But at this point, I've played enough pacifist missions in Fortnite that I've gotten really good at staying alive. I can pretty consistently make it into the top two players, and this is where my social experiments get extra interesting. Can you make friends when there's only one player left in a battle royale? Will the human urge to be social ever outweigh the psychological manipulation of an addictive reward structure? Especially during the most tense, high-stakes, all-or-nothing moment of a game? Let's try the absurdist approach, and just start clowning around to see how the other player reacts. I'm just sitting here, minding my own business. Okay, they're not sure what to do. Damn it! Oh, come on. Could have been friends. Who wants a hug? I think that sort of worked. We are friends now. Oh. Beyond the addictive incentive structures we talked about earlier, making friends is also difficult because Fortnite's battle royale format puts players in a defensive psychological mindset. Since it's a zero-sum game where everyone else is out to get you, it's only logical to adopt an antisocial mentality. The game's systems have, in effect, trained players to always be on high alert and to always assume hostility on the part of others. This might not be possible. Okay, you know the drill. Obviously, I died a ridiculous number of times trying to do this. You get the idea. But after all those attempts, I finally accomplished it. I made a friend with the last remaining player in a winner-take-all battle royale deathmatch. Just to make sure it wasn't a fluke, I did this a bunch of times. Some players only indulged me up until the point where there was room for one of us in the storm circle. But others joined me in rejecting the game's insistence that we eventually turn on each other. This Asholot gave me a high five and then proceeded to blow themselves up and let me win. This player actually threw down their weapons, and we had a dance party together to the end. Now, even though I didn't earn a bunch of XP or unlock any battle pass rewards for my efforts, I do think that making friends in Fortnite might be the hardest challenge I've ever accomplished in any video game. And honestly, I've been a little surprised by the number of players who were willing to join me in my little social revolt. Now, at the risk of being too presumptuous about the conclusions we can draw from playing Fortnite, I want to briefly discuss human nature. Let's return to Lord of the Flies for a moment. The book's author, William Golding, held a particularly disdainful opinion of humanity. He once wrote that World War II had taught him that man produces evil as a bee produces honey. That deeply cynical view of human nature is reflected throughout his novel. 
which promotes the idea that without coercive systems of authority to keep us in line, human beings will descend into a natural state of violent savagery. Even though the Battle Royale movie uses the same trapped on a remote island premise, it doesn't share the same cynical perspective. In fact, the film is a social critique that stakes out almost the exact opposite position on human nature. A bunch of the school children in this story actively resist attempts to force them into conflict with each other. Some even choose suicide over the prospect of killing their classmates. Another key difference is that this horrifying situation doesn't happen by accident, like it does in Lord of the Flies. The situation is purposely orchestrated by the authorities. Meaning the blame for the resulting bloodbath isn't pinned on some imaginary natural state of savagery like it is in Golding's novel. The blame for the students' violence is instead placed squarely on the powerful institutions that force otherwise decent people into desperate situations. In this case, a battle royale, during which many of the unwilling participants still choose to help each other. Fortnite's message is a little harder to parse. Its central driving focus is, of course, to manipulate young people into forking over as much money as possible. Beyond that, the game's narrative is largely nonsensical. It mainly exists to facilitate map changes or explain why the Mandalorian is suddenly on the island. What passes for a story certainly isn't meant as a social critique or a treatise on human nature. But meaning isn't just derived from narrative. Game systems and mechanics also carry implicit messages. To adapt the famous phrase from philosopher Marshall McLuhan, the game mechanics are the message. And as has been illustrated over the course of this video, most of Fortnite's core mechanics celebrate aggressive, self-serving behaviors that are very much in line with the philosophy of Lord of the Flies. On the other hand, players are only acting in antisocial ways because the creators of the game have designed it specifically to encourage, reward, and require those type of interactions. In that way of looking at it, the Battle Royale game system does echo the dystopian scenario set up in the Battle Royale movie. Of course, in that comparison, Epic Games, the creators of Fortnite, would be analogous to the villains in a horror movie which honestly does track. But the larger point is that game systems are not entirely prescriptive. Since humans are not robots, the players always represent an unpredictable variable. And as such, they can choose to step off the path of least resistance. They can, as we've seen, choose to help each other instead of fighting. In order to underscore this point, let's take a look at what was arguably the most interesting disruption to Fortnite's gameplay pattern. In 2020, Epic Games released an update that introduced drivable cars to the island. One of those vehicles was a taxi, and players immediately began role-playing as taxi drivers. They'd ignore combat and instead roam the map, picking up and dropping off other players. So, of course, I decided to start my own taxi service. Here we go. And we both have exactly the same idea. They're thinking about it. It didn't always work. Uh, that's my car. The bots didn't understand the concept at all. But a surprising number of players were perfectly willing to stop shooting and accept a ride. Some even remained allies throughout the match. This is how I met the Asholo player I talked about earlier. The same game update also inspired players to roleplay as gas station attendants at various locations around the island. Although some players would drop a small token of appreciation before driving off, there is no significant material or mechanical incentive for players to be interacting in these social ways. And yet they did. In fact, so many players participated in these impromptu taxi or gas station services that a bunch of news articles were written about the phenomenon. So the question is why? 
Why would players offer mutual aid inside of a winner-take-all system, especially when doing so puts them at a considerable disadvantage in the match? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to leave the cartoony fantasy of Fortnite behind and take a very quick trip into the real world. On a base physiological level, altruistic pro-social behavior makes people feel good. It provides a tangible sense of meaning and purpose. And that feeling of personal happiness and satisfaction still occurs even when assisting others comes at a personal cost to yourself. On a broader sociological level, human beings are drawn to and thrive in communities where exchange and reciprocity are fundamental norms. In light of that, we might ask, what would really happen if people found themselves marooned on a deserted island? Well, that exact situation occurred in 1965, when six Tongan students were shipwrecked and spent over a year on a tiny Polynesian island in the Pacific Ocean. As it turns out, the group of boys did not violently turn on each other. They instead worked together to help each other survive the difficult ordeal. If you're interested, you could read more about this story in the book Humankind by Rutger Bregman. Now that's just one small example, but it does help demonstrate that William Golding was ultimately wrong when he wrote Lord of the Flies. Left to our own devices, human beings aren't inherently selfish and antisocial. To the contrary, we have a strong tendency towards altruism and solidarity. Our instincts are to interact in mutually beneficial ways, despite the many restrictive structures that we often find ourselves having to navigate, both in real life and inside of video games. Now obviously I've been playing this game wrong on purpose, but my successful experiments in Fortnite make clear that there's a great hunger for a different kind of online multiplayer experience. And while most MMOs do include at least some options for social engagement, the core gameplay mechanics, like the ways to level up or advance the story, are invariably tied to combat. Shot a couple extra guys just to be safe. I did, I did a lot of shooting, if I'm being totally honest. So why aren't more games explicitly designed around social interaction? Game systems could very easily incentivize, reward, or require collaborative, pro-social interaction between players. But most don't. It's maybe worth mentioning that Fortnite did introduce a combat-free party royale mode. Unfortunately, the available activities there are mostly just imported from the battle royale system, and thus aren't really designed for social interaction. So the whole experience just falls flat and feels very isolating. One of the most interesting examples of an explicitly pro-social multiplayer game is a little experimental indie title called Meadow. In that game, making friends with other players is essential for progression. There's also Sky, Children of the Light, which is built around social interactions with eight other players. And there are a number of other indie games currently in development that promise social gameplay as a central mechanic. Book of Travels is from the same developer as Meadow, and is described as a TMOG, or Tiny Multiplayer Online Game. We are never truly alone. While these audacious experiments do look exciting, they very much remain rare exceptions to the rule. There's still an enormous amount of unrealized potential, and game developers would do well to tap into the human instinct for sociability and give players digital spaces where they can show altruism, practice solidarity, and engage in mutual aid. Because as Fortnite accidentally proves, players are already engaging in those ways, even inside of winner-take-all style games. On other YouTube videos, this is where you'd normally see an ad or some sort of corporate sponsorship. But since this channel doesn't do any of that, here's a video of my cats instead. All Pop Detective video essays are 100% funded by viewers like you. So if you like what you see, please consider going over to Patreon to help support this project. I've also left a link to PayPal donations and a wish list below if you prefer. There are a whole bunch more long form video essays in the works, including one on patriarchy according to the Barbie movie, one on how Hollywood often confuses redemption and death, and finally a huge project 
on colonialism in modern board games. So please make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of those. Until next time, thanks for watching.